One of the things we've been talking about is life change, and it's not, that's not recent, but uh, I think we've heard from, I, I hear from a lot of people uh, in our congregation that you don't get the chance to hear from a lot of times, and so one of the things we're going to begin to do uh, is to hear more and more from people in our congregation who God's really been working in their lives, and they're just going to tell you their story. Uh, we wrapped up last week this series called Traders and about learning what it means to trade in the uh, pursuit of the American dream and uh, trade it in for a world that needs Christ and to begin to live for that instead of the American dream. So a person, uh, one, of our, one of the people, many people I've heard from was uh, Shauna Wood. And so Shauna, if you'd come forward and she's just going to tell you kind of what God has done in her life uh, through that. Uh, through that challenge, through the book Radical, and just personally how God's beginning to transform her life and Nate's life into a brand new thing. Thank you, Shauna. So I read Radical a few months ago. Is it on? No, turn it on the bottom. Ta-da! <laughs> huh? I'm on now. So I finished reading Radical like about a month or so ago, and it was just one of those books that Nate told me to pick it up and read it when he started it, and I couldn't put it down until I was done. It took about a week to read through. And it, along with Casey's sermons, have been very life-changing for me, and I'll just share a little bit about what's going on in my heart and how my eyes have changed. I, uh, I've really been convicted about two big commandments that God has given us, and one of those commandments is that we're commanded to take care of the needy, and the other commandment is that we're commanded to go and tell others about him. When I finished reading Radical a few months ago, the big thing that stuck out with me was how many people die of starvation and curable diseases every day, and it's 26,000 people. So in a week, Topeka would be gone, and I just, I couldn't believe that many people actually die from that. And if everybody would just give 10% to the needy, there would be no starved statistics. And it just burdens me knowing how richly blessed we are here in America, while other people literally have nothing to live on. Some families live on about $400 a day, and here in America, by America's statistics, 30000 a year is considered poverty, I think. $400 a year, you said a day. Oh, sorry. We could make it on a day, but... <laughs> yeah. I'm really going to mess this up this time. No. <laughs> so, 400 a year compared to America's low income being 30,000 a year, and it just, that's a huge difference, and it just, it's so unfair, and it just kills me that we have so much, and other people just have nothing. So, I look around our house, and I see that we live pretty modestly, and I've never really felt like we got hung up on materialistic positions, but yet... I compare my life and our stuff compared to what Jesus had, and Jesus never owned a home. He never had a closet full of clothes, never had a kitchen full of food, and he never had toys scattered everywhere. And we've been, Nate and I have been looking around our house and thinking and selling various stuff of what we just don't need that other people can benefit from. And we wanting, we're wanting to take some of our clothes and toys and give to families that may not even have a change of clothes or they may not even have a toy to play with. And I'm still waiting to find out where that place is, but I'm ready to mail stuff off because we just, we have such an abundance and I want to bless families with our abundance for them. And we also want to be able to give our money sacrificially. We've cut our budget down quite a bit. We've got rid of our uh, dish cable. We got rid of our gym membership. And we already give joyfully, but I want to give so much more than we're already giving right now. I want us to get to a point where we're just living on strictly X amount of dollars, and anything above and beyond that always goes to the needy. And I understand that it's okay to spend money on ourselves, go to the movies, going out to eat, you know, stuff you got to do on your house and whatnot. But I've, I'm having my eyes changed and my heart changed, and I'm asking myself, Am I living this life for me, or am I living my life for others? And living selfishly is a big struggle for me. I wake up every morning, and I think, what do I want to do today? What, what, what's going to make me happy? And I always have to remind myself that this life I'm living is for Christ and for others. I've also realized that in America, we live so independently, and I'm realizing maybe that's all wrong. The book of Acts talks about community, 
And I'm beginning to wonder, maybe this is a little extreme, but homes maybe aren't meant to be single-family dwellings. And maybe our elderly parents are supposed to live with us or our single folks or whoever. I also wonder why we store so much in our retirement storehouses when if we lived in community, we would take care of one another and meet each other's needs. We have, Nate and I have some money in a retirement account, and we're just really praying right now. We have some school loan debt, and we're like, do we pay our debt off and then give the rest to the needy? Or we do, do we do what everybody else in the world says to do and keep it in the account for us? I don't know that answer yet. So on another note, for my birthday, I got a chronological Bible, and I started reading it in November, and I started reading out the passages that were broke out for a day, and up until this point, I'd never read the Old Testament. It was boring to me. I didn't understand it. I'd get lost. But I really had a new, I don't know what's, God's just really been speaking through the Old Testament to me, and I've realized there's so much history there about God showing who he is and that he's the same person today that he was back then. And the stuff I'm reading now in the Old Testament is just amazing. I mean, I'm just amazed how much I can see how it fits and how I, it can apply to my life. The Old Testament stories that I'm reading right now, I'm embarrassed to say that this is the first time I read them. I know about them because I've heard about them, but I've never read them. And I've been in church for years and years, and I've just never, I've always would read in the New Testament instead of the Old. So this book that I've had at my fingertips for so long, I'm, I've just finally have started to have a thirst for it. And I put the kids down for quiet time, and I usually lay down and take a nap myself too. But uh, I, I just, I love being able to have 30 or 45 minutes and just read and absorb and find out what God is telling me in that passage. For the first time ever, I read how the Israelites left Egypt, and I read that entire story. And over and over and over again, how they continually turned away and were selfish, but yet over and over and over again, God showed compassion and mercy and forgave him, and he would do. He did so many miracles with them that I just never even knew about. I learned for the first time that where tithing began was when the Israelites were instructed to take care of the Levites because they didn't have their own land and livestock. I never read much about King David's life except the fact that he um, was the little boy that killed the giant, and I didn't even put the two together, that King David was the same as David and Goliath. So just right now where I'm at in that reading is I just finished up about his life and how he passed his kingdom down to his son Solomon, and I'm right now in the undated Psalms. So I've just really discovered how awesome the Bible is and how over and over again God is forgiving, and I know that he's going to be that forgiving for me also because every day I mess up. Every day I am selfish, and I I'm, I'm always just wanting to live life for myself, but God is right there like he was for the people back in the Old Testament, and he's always going to love me. So another reason of wanting to read the Bible cover to cover is so I can do bi biblical storytelling. I had went to a, con a women's conference last fall, and they had a breakout session of that, and it was just absolutely amazing because it was as if I was a grade school student and I had my eyes closed, and you had this person telling you, this very energetic love, um, um, just a very action-packed, love-packed story that you just, you've got yourself so involved in it, you can see it playing out in your mind. And I thought, I want to do that. So, but first I have to read the Bible cover to cover <laughs> and study it. So I'm hoping by next, by the end of the year, I can get the Bible finished read through and work on my outline and possibly by next summer I'll be able to have my story made and I can come in front of you and tell it. So I'm reading the Bible to get to know God better, more personally. We're cutting our budget to give to the needy and we also want to use what God has already given us to bless others, like for instance our house. Um, we host Life Group. We're having our sister live with us right now. We, I stay home with my boys so I have two extra kids that I watch and I'm just trying to instill the life of Christ in them also. I feel that as a mom, my job is to teach my kids 
about Jesus. It's important that they learn about him here, but I need to be teaching them seven days a week also. Teaching them in that God made them, and he made them very special. And also to teach them to listen and obey. That's, if you ask Nate, listen and obey is what I say 20,000 times a day. And I realized that God is also telling me to listen and obey. And I'm just like my kids where I'm continually trying to do my own thing and God's just smacking me up the side of the head and saying, Shauna, listen and obey, listen and obey. So when I finished reading the book Radical and I saw the Radical Challenge at the end of it, I thought I could do that over a course of a year. But the thing that scares me is I know it's going to change my life. I don't know what the future holds for me, but I know that God has something exciting. And just by the changes that have already occurred, I have a feeling it's just the tip of an iceberg. So I'm reading the Bible. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm embracing the five points of the radical challenge of reading the Bible, praying for people groups and praying for workers, going on an annual mission trip, giving up my financial spending to give to others, and committing to the church. What will happen at the end of the year for us or in 10 years for us? I don't know. Maybe God's going to tell us to go to Africa in 10 years. Maybe God's going to tell us to adopt children. Maybe he's going to tell us to sell our house so we have lower housing expenses. I know right now, though, without a shadow of a doubt, that God says, I have you right here for a reason. And he wants me to stop being silent. I so often don't give God the credit of what he's doing in my life. And I need to be vocalizing that to my friends and my families and my neighbors through my actions and also my words. I need to remember that everything God has given us, he's given us for a reason. And I need to use my possessions, my time, my talent, and my money for the glory of God. So as I said earlier, I'm embracing the five points of the challenge, and I know that I will not be the same person a year from now as I am today. Well, that's why we do what we do um, at Covenant. And I, I just thank you, Shauna, for being fearless, and uh, I, I was kind of curious when you said that Nate hears you say that listen and obey 20,000 times a day, I was kind of curious, is he talking to him or, the, yeah, I could, I could, I, that makes sense now, <laughs> kids learn faster than that, <laughs> season. thank you for sharing your life change story, I want to do something, we're going to start off a, a series, um, and I'm going to abbreviate today a little bit, because that's the best sermon you're going to hear, is, is somebody's life that is literally changing so that you know that God is at work here and that's what we want you to know not that you know I, I don't really care if you know whether I can preach or not I do care that you know that God is real and powerful and uh, that people's lives in this congregation are beginning to turn in a radical sort of way and so it, it, it's exciting I want to start something with you that I, I, I want to spend some time on and, and it's talking about exactly what Sean was talking what's the difference What's the difference in my life before Jesus, becoming a follower of Jesus, and after? She, she illustrated that perfect, uh, some of those radical changes that take place. Jesus never came to talk about uh, just living a more moral life or anything. Uh, Jesus came to transform us. So we're going to ask this question. What's the difference in your life now compared to your life uh, before following Jesus? So as Jesus comes... And we talk about Jesus and we talk about knowing him and living in a relationship with him. We want you to know at the outset that Jesus came to radically transform us, which means, which means that there should be distinct differences uh, between life we had before, before Jesus and the life we have in Jesus. So we're going to look at something today and we're going to talk about forgiveness. Because I think forgiveness is foundational to everything. If you don't know that you are reconciled to God, that be, be, things between you and God are, are in good standing, that you are right with Him, that your sin has been taken care of, that your guilt and shame has been removed. If you don't know that, it's very, very hard to approach God and actually to trust Him to lead you into this great unknown. Okay, so we're going to talk about this radical difference of forgiveness. And uh, we're going to look at Romans chapter 4 and verses 4 through 8. I'm going to read that, to, uh, I'm going to read it off the screen because I don't, I have it in a, in a, the New American Standard, but we're going to read it together, uh, or I'm going to read that on here from the New Living Translation. This is Romans chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. May I have you stand in the honor of reading God's Word today uh, to recognize we're not just reading another book. When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. 
But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. David said, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. Would you pray with me? God, today I'm just asking that you would take Shauna's words, that life example, that you would take the powerful, powerful sword of your word and you would speak into our lives. God, we are desperate for you. We may not realize it. We may not feel it. It may not be at the forefront of our thoughts today, but we are desperate for you to be real and powerful in each one of our lives. And we cannot follow Jesus and stay the same, so help us to understand that. Help us to know that you have never called somebody just to come live a moral life and become a good church member. You have called us to live radically devoted to you. So I pray that you would have freedom in this time to speak through your word and to your people that we would all be uh, with, uh, leave here with an undeniable awareness of your presence and the truth that is spoken in your word. God, give me that power to speak that in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. All right, let's go through this just quick. This is not a hard passage to understand, but let's kind of go verse by verse and look at it. The first thing he says, when people work, their wages are not a gift, so, uh, but, but something they've earned. So when you get a paycheck, when you, when you get paid, whether it's every two weeks, every month, or whatever, or every week, you've earned that. That is, you have agreed to work this many hours to do this amount of, jo of a job, and you would get paid this much. And so that's all he's saying, all right? We all know that, that when people work, their wages are not a gift. They're earned. They're, it's a fair trade. But he says that's not the same in God's economy, okay? So he says, but, but people are counted as righteous. That means right with God, okay? That's all that means. Doesn't, when you say righteous, don't think that they're holier than thou or perfect moral people or anything. It just means when they say they're, they're declared righteous, it means your standing before God is right, that you are good, you're reconciled with him. There's nothing counted against you, okay? So he says when people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. So he's making a contrast. He's saying when you work and you get paid, that's a fair exchange. But when it comes to right standing with God, when you are reconciled to God, which is far greater than, than just getting a paycheck, right? Uh, this, this, re, re, this thing we receive called righteousness or right standing, huge. I mean, that's, that's enormous. I mean, who would not want to know that they're right before God? And he says, it's not like that. We don't do something that, that earns that standing. We don't work X amount of hours. We don't do X amount of good things. We don't have this many good works in our lives or, or become this moral of a person. And then we're declared righteous. He says, it's not like that. It's not like the exchange of work for pay. He says, instead, but because of their faith. It's our faith in God who forgives sinners that, that we're declared righteous. So it's, it's a gift, is what he's saying. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 and 9 says that, uh, for by grace we've been saved, not by works. It's a gift of God, okay? So that's all he is saying there. So in verse 4 he says, we get what we earn when we work. But in verse 5 he's saying, not so with God. Not so in God's economy and how he works. This salvation or this forgiveness is, an, is a gift. So when it comes to being right with God, we can't earn that standing. We receive that as a gift, expressing faith in Jesus. And he says verse, in verse 6, Shauna referenced King David. Same guy. Probably some of you learned something just when she said that. We just don't like to admit that stuff. So I appreciate your, your candor and your honesty there. That King David... It was the same guy that was David and Goliath. That's all one person. And he's the same person that spoke these words. And he said, he said uh, in verse 6, he said, well, it says, King David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. Did you hear that? Declared righteous without working for it. And then he describes uh, what that's like in verse 7. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Let's just kind of stop there for a minute. Whose disobedience, it says, is forgiven. Disobedience is a word for sin, but it's, also, it's probably better described as lawlessness. It, it just means this, that when, when we are born, we are born with a human nature. We call it a human nature. It's, it's better described as a sinful nature. And a sinful nature is, is automatically in rebellion to God. You say, well, how did I get that nature? I didn't want that nature. Well, you got it from Adam and Eve. We inherited that from our, our first father and mother. And that we've, it's been passed along through the, the genetic code of humanity since day one. And we've all inherited it. 
And this sinful nature rebels against God. It doesn't want to go with God. It wants to, to go its own way. Like Shauna was sharing her honest struggle with selfishness. I share that struggle. That every day I want to wake up and live for me. But that's my old nature. That's the nature that discounts God. It doesn't want what God's got for me. It wants what Casey's got for me. And so he says, this nature, this lawlessness in verse 7 is forgiven. And it's a rebellion against God. And, but, it says, but it says it's sent away. In verse 7, that's what he says. He says, whose sins are forgiven. And that, that literally means to send something away. To put it out of sight. To get rid of it. To, to abolish it. To, to ban it from our presence. Total forgiveness from God. And then he says, there are, in, in the rest of that verse, in verse 7, he says, whose sins are forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. And, and it also means literally to, to make to where they, it doesn't exist. That's hard to imagine, isn't it? I mean, that God would take your sin, and then when you place your faith in Jesus, he counts your sin as something that no longer exists. He has wiped it clean. He talks about that in just a minute. He goes on to say that, that in the rest of that verse 8, he says, Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. Your record is cleared of sin. We think of it like this. If, if, uh, if you get a speeding ticket and you have that on your record, I mean, you'll have it on your record, and I don't know how long it stays there, but you, it's, it's a debt you owe until you pay the price for the ticket. And you have to pay the price yourself, but not so with right standing with God. You don't have to pay the price. And, and it's not because you could and God said you don't have to. It's because we can't and God said we have to. We can't pay it, but somebody's got to pay it. That, that is our sin debt. We owe that to God. That is, there's a, there was a result for sin. God doesn't just ignore it. God doesn't just say it's there, but we can deal with it. God said it has to be dealt with. And so the Bible says that the wages of sin, the payment for sin, is death. But if we died, then, then God couldn't have a relationship with us. And, and the whole of the Bible that, that Shauna was talking about tells us the story that God wants a relationship with us. And I hope you can stop and just kind of let that soak in, that God wants a relationship with you. And if you had to pay the debt for your own sin, you wouldn't get that because the payment for sin is death. But David said, what joy, in verse 8, for those whose record the Lord has cleared the Lord has totally cleared of sin. Blessed, by the way, if you're reading in the New American Standard or other translations, means more than happy. The New Living Translation doesn't get this really good. It's, it's not just the happiness. Happiness is generally thought of as a circumstantial. My circumstances are good, so I'm happy. But this is a lot deeper than that, a, a whole lot deeper. Happiness is uh, makarios, and, and it's, it means this. When you really dig into it, it's pretty deep. It means to be completely satisfied and filled up. It means to have this deep sense of, I am totally okay. It's a happy feeling, but it's much more than that. It means to, that you have this complete sense of satisfaction that comes by the reality of God's kingdom indwelling you. Remember when I was telling the kids a minute ago that the Holy Spirit comes to live inside a Christ follower? That is the kingdom of God living in your life that by, by Jesus' Holy Spirit. And, and when, we, when that happens, there is a sense, makarios, this word blessed, it's beyond happiness, it's beyond just joy, it is this incredible sense of, if I am complete, I am satisfied, life is okay. It doesn't mean that we're indifferent by any means, but that hunger, that longing, that lack that we feel is filled. And he says, blessed is the person who realizes their sins have been covered over. The record of wrong has been cleared. Incredible truth. This is true treasure. Our guilt and shame has been removed completely in Christ. Because see, there are people in this room who are carrying their guilt and shame today. Even as Christ followers, we pick it up and we put it on our shoulders because we think that what we've done is not under the, the rest of this forgiveness thing. And we believe a lie and we carry it around and it begins to be very, very heavy baggage. It's one thing to carry, you know, a little weight for a few minutes. It's another thing to carry a little weight for a long, long, long time. And I just want to ask you to think about, are you there? Are you walking around thinking that you're less in God's kingdom because of the sin and the shame and the guilt 
for whatever it may be, are you walking around feeling unforgiven, like God's got not as much use for you because of, of your disobedience or your failure? And, and the Bible says that's just not true. It's not true because your sin has been covered over. The, the record has been cleared. Your guilt and your shame has totally been removed. That's why Paul said in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation, none, zero, zilch, for those who are in Christ Jesus. So the Christ follower has this indescribable peace of knowing they are forever free from the guilt and penalty of our sin against God. Forever free from that. Friend, I want to ask you something. I really want you to ask yourself this. Have you stopped lately? Let me just ask those who are Christ followers, professing Christians, Jesus followers, real quick. Have you, have you stopped lately to see if you're carrying that excess baggage in the form of guilt and shame? That's something that you hope no one finds out. Something that you, Maybe you still struggle with the sin. Maybe you're still dealing with it. And you're just walking around like you're a second-class Christian, a second-class church member. Maybe you even walk in fear that somebody's going to find you out. Friend, God already knows your sin. He already knows that you're broken. He already knows that it's a battle in this life. He already knows that, and, and he doesn't okay it. He doesn't say, well, you know, I know it's a struggle, so just go ahead and give up the fight. But what he does is he wants you to know that that sin that you still carry, that shame, that guilt, all of that unforgiveness that you bear the weight of is unnecessary because you have been justified before God. You have been declared right before him permanently. You say, well, what about if I still sin? It, it's still covered doesn't mean that your relationship can't get dampened. When, you, when my children sin against me, quote-unquote, I, I love them desperately, but it can certainly create a distance in our intimacy and the way we experience each other. doesn't change their standing as my son. doesn't st change how much I love them whatsoever. It, just, it, it does affect the intimacy. And if you're carrying sin and you don't know you're really, truly, genuinely, awesomely forgiven, it's going to affect your intimacy and your experience of God. But it will not affect your standing because you've been declared his son, his daughter, permanently. And that can't change. You have been totally, completely forgiven. So your standing as innocent before God is secured by the death of Jesus on your behalf. Whether you believe that or not, I mean, that's the reality. Not just everybody, but those who have turned their life over to Jesus and become Jesus followers. Not church members, not good people, not more moral citizens, but Jesus followers. Somebody has, has said, I don't want that sin life of lawlessness and rebellious. I want to follow Jesus. So let, let's ask this question. What's the difference in your life now and before your life in Christ? One thing. Well, there's a bunch, but we're starting with this one. You are forgiven. Period. There's not dot, 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 except. There's not a but after that. You are forgiven. Totally and completely, no matter how you feel. Listen to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. I quoted earlier. For by grace you've been saved through faith. That's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not as the result of works, so that no one may boast. You've been declared right as a gift. As a gift. And I just want to challenge us as we start this. Here's, the, here's kind of the motive behind this whole thing as I close. Is I think that one reason we don't talk about Jesus more naturally, more authentically in just our everyday lives is we just forget about the treasure that we have in Christ. We just theologize it and say, well, that's all theory. It's theolog theological. It's doctrinal. It's not practical. It's not real. I want to tell you that, that living in a forgiven state before God, knowing that my guilt, my shame has been erased before the one that matters most is life-altering. It's not just mind-altering. It's not just theological stuff I can put over on the shelf. Knowing that I am free from condemnation from God is life-changing. And it's a treasure that people are desperately trying to, to, to find. And they're trying to find it all kinds of ways other than surrendering their lives to the one who offers it as a gift. When you start enjoying and celebrating the gift of your forgiveness, when you start that, it's going to be really hard not to talk about it with others. It's just going to be incredible. So here's what we're going to do. 
I, I want to ask you to take Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemna condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I just want you to do what we did a few weeks ago. I heard from many of you that that was, that was effective and it helped you. I'm not asking you to memorize it. I'm asking you to write it down somewhere or record it on your phone and let, play it back. However you want to do. I just want three times a day for a week thing again. Every morning you read, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Every afternoon you read that, and every evening you read that. But every time you read it, you say this, do I believe that? I know pastor believes it, but do I believe it? Is this real to me? And if it is real, then you ask these questions just to follow up, just to reflect. Don't write it down. I'm not asking you to journal. You can do that if you want. But I just want you to ask these questions in your heart and your mind. If this is something I believe then how should it change my attitude toward myself? Some of you are self-haters. You love other people, but you just don't like yourself at all. It's because you feel guilty and you feel shame. But if there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, how should you feel about yourself? Ask another question. How should it change my attitude toward other people? If, there is no, if I am free and God has freely forgiven me and that would mean that he is willing to freely forgive others, how should it change my attitude towards those who have offended me, who have hurt me, who, who are in my past and I can't get back to them but there's still this connection through this grief that, that I carry along? How should it change my attitude toward others? How should it change my mood today? If the God of heaven and earth who is real, who is, who is, who is tangible in every way except with our own little senses, if he is there and he has forgiven you, how should that affect the way you operate in terms of a mood today? You ever wake up in a bad mood? You ever have one little thing happen and it changes your mood for the whole day? So if we can get in a bad mood because somebody in the roundabout stops for 50 cars to go through us and I'm self-confessing and you honk and they just like, why? They're going. I don't know what to do. And you just, they're just going and you're thinking this was created for traffic flow. I'm off the tangent. If, 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 that, if you have a mood thing that changes, if that can change because of something so small and so petty, couldn't it, just go with me here, couldn't it be this incredible treasure you wake up and say I am forgiven today no matter what I do no matter how bad I act or perform I want to follow God but I know that I'm not perfect but I am forgiven the record's clear failures have been erased how should that change your mood and, and last thing how should it change your problems your perspective on them anyway you're still going to have problems right I still got people. Please don't stop at a roundabout. Come on. If I can get 200 people in Topeka to do this, it'd be great. Don't stop. It's a yield sign. There's no four-way stop. Just go as soon as you can. If you have to pull out in front of somebody because they're being rude, go ahead and do that. They'll honk, but they will stop. So far, they have all stopped. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. I have an issue. I do. How could it change your perspective on your problems? Well, I just don't like my boss. If I could get the raise, if da 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 da. But listen, you have a treasure, and it's yours, and no one can take it away. You are forgiven by the one that matters most. Period. Jesus did that for you. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this truth. Thank you for this treasure. Somehow, through my clumsy words and through Shauna's incredible t life change testimony, that you would, you would embed this in our lives, that we could live as forgiven people. God, I think we would forgive a lot more people if we lived forgiven ourselves. If we knew that we were justified before you by Jesus and not by our works, if we lived out of that, it would change us. God, I'm convinced it would. I'm convinced with all of my heart, it would revolutionize the people of God today. Let this be the bedrock of how we move forward. Secure it in our hearts. May you use the powerful truth in Romans 8.1 to begin to alter the way we think this week. May we all take that challenge to meditate on it and, and honestly wrestle with whether we believe that statement or not. And to carry that out to how it should affect us if we say we do. Speak to us now. We want to respond to you in Jesus' name. Amen.